During the mid-1980s, a vibrant music scene took root in the Pacific Northwest region of the USA, and from this emerged an alternative rock subgenre. Characterised by punk rock-inspired riffs, distorted guitars and heavy bass lines, it was the antithesis of commercial hair metal, and in contrast to the trends of opulence and excess of 1980s fashion and pop culture. It was loud and rebellious, often with dark, introspective lyrics that dealt with the darker, harsher realities of life. In a pre-internet era, to promote concerts and records, artists created music signs and flyers which would be placed in record shops and posters would be pasted on street lamps and shop windows and on the walls of subways. Venues were soon heaving with greasy-haired twenty-somethings wearing baggy mismatched clothes. A notable element to this era was the level of connectedness between the bands. Sharing a practice space was common, and inevitably, when many musicians share a geographical location, there's going to be collaborations and interactions. But when you map the bands of that era, from Green River, Mother Love Bone, Melvins, Mud Honey, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana and Alice in Chains, they are all deeply interwoven and linked. And I think Matt Cameron might have drummed for just about everyone on the planet. Like its punk predecessor, this underground music culture with its DIY ethos empowered musicians to take control of their own music production, promotion and distribution. And so independent labels began to sprout up with the aim to promote regional bands. One such indie label was Seattle-based Sub Pop Records, whose clever marketing would propel the so-called Seattle sound onto the radar of the British music press. And this was the spark that exploded into what would be dubbed the grunge music scene. Grunge became a buzzword and journalists scrambled over each other to secure interviews with anyone even remotely linked to the scene. The focus shifted from the music and began to fixate on superficial details and fashion choices. What was once DIY and anti-fashion morphed into a marketable commodity in an ironic twist that continues to echo in the present day. The same thing happened with punk though. A certain game recently released a grunge package which has absolutely nothing to do with the music. Local musicians distanced themselves from the label grunge, finding it uncomplimentary, and they were becoming irritated with external misrepresentation. Megan Jasper had just begun working at Sub Pop. She was known to have a prankish personality, and during a phone call to a journalist who was seeking a lexicon of grunge, she decided to fuck with her interviewers and provided them with increasingly ridiculous made-up slang expressions. And I was like, uh, why don't you just give me a word and I'll give you the, the grunge slang for it. She just started making stuff up. A lot of it was kind of stuff that she used for herself just for laughs. And next thing you know, it's on the cover of the New York Times and everybody around here is just giggling and sorting. If they're lame enough to try to scrutinize this totally stupid thing, why not fuck with them? Well, the buzz got buzzier. Only a few select bands would ascend to mainstream popularity, inadvertently leaving behind numerous local bands that had long before managed to cultivate devoted followings within the area. They made a big mistake. They, they didn't go further and find more of the bands that were already here, and had been here even before the bands that were exploited were. You know, that's what may, it makes me feel guilty of the success of our band because it should have been uh, spread out to the, the success of like a number of bands. Among the noteworthy bands that achieved this mainstream recognition were Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Nirvana and Pearl Jam, also known as the Big Four. Clusters of other bands were often lumped in such as Stone Temple Pilots, and riot girl groups including L7, Babes in Toyland and Bikini Kill, basically due to time and proximity. But it was Nirvana's 1991 seminal hit, Smells Like Teen Spirit, that launched the so-called Seattle Sound into the mainstream consciousness, captivating the MTV generation. You listen to the first 30 seconds of it and you go, my God, you're blown away by it, even before Kurt begins to sing. The song owes its title to Kurt Cobain's friend Kathleen Hanna of Bikini Kill, who wrote on Kurt's wall, Kurt smells like teen spirit. Cobain misinterpreted this phrase as some sort of revolutionary motto connected to anarchism and punk ideology. However, Hanna was alluding to a deodorant named Teen Spirit. 
As the world was eating grunge for breakfast, grunge for lunch and grunge for dinner, many artists grappled with the challenge of reconciling their punk rock roots with the evil mechanisms of the corporate mainstream music industry. The other thing that happened was an influx of heroin into America, and more in line with the literal meaning of grunge. This insidious filth soon permeated Seattle from the ground up, taking hold of those who were struggling with mental health issues, becoming a friend to the disillusioned, and becoming popular among a bunch of 20-somethings who yearned to escape, or probably just wanted to get a bit fucked up. It's unclear where Seattle's problem with heroin started, but by the late 1990s, the smack had arrived in the Pacific Northwest. What is not disputed is the drug's persuasive presence. The Drug Abuse Warning Network has been charting the national heroin rise for years. There's a 34% increase in heroin from 1986 to 1994. Heroin fatalities increased nearly 300%. Heroin had always been Seattle's dark little secret, and it's a shameful secret. But the new generation of junkies who moved to the city are not ashamed of it at all. They're not visible in public. It's a badge of honor. In Seattle, if you know your way around heroin, it's like takeout food. You can have your dope delivered. Even in early 2023, when I personally visited Seattle, there was more than one person openly shooting up heroin in the street. And in this thriving community of talented young artists, it was this that would ravage and leave many deep scars in its wake. It all began somewhere over here on this incestuous music tree, with bands like Malfunction, Melvins, and who are these guys? Oh, that's that dude from, yeah, anyway. In 1988, in Seattle, Washington, a band called Mother Love Bone was formed. The brainchild of two musicians, Andrew Wood and Stone Gossard, who had played together in previously mentioned Malfunction. Andrew Wood was the lead vocalist, while Stone Gossard played guitar. The band's lineup came together with the addition of several other talented musicians. Bassist Jeff Ament, who had previously played in Green River, guitarist Bruce Fairweather, also a former member of Green River, and drummer Greg Gilmore, previously of Skinyard, fusing elements of rock, glam and punk with Andrew Wood's impressively dynamic melodic rasp and emotionally charged lyrics, Mother Love Bone was born. And shortly thereafter, in 1988, they signed a record deal with Polygram subsidiary Mercury Records. And in December 1989, they began recording their debut album, Apple, at Seattle's London Bridge Studio. Besides his infectious stage presence and devilishly flamboyant dress sense, singer Andrew Wood was well known for being a bit of a comedian. He was also very supportive and encouraging to his fellow musicians. Born on January the 8th, 1966, Andrew Wood was the youngest of three brothers. From early childhood, he showed enthusiasm for performing. Inspired by Elton John, glam rock and frontmen such as Mark Bolan, Jim Morrison and Freddie Mercury. Showing a natural talent for songwriting and showmanship, at age 14 he formed his first band, Malfunction, with his brother Kevin. With a history of substance abuse issues within his family, Wood began experimenting with drugs from a young age, smoking marijuana at 11 years old. By his late teens, he began using cocaine and heroin. After spending some time in drug rehab, he moved in with his fellow musician Chris Cornell, hoping to stay clean and focus on his music career. Just prior to the band's album release, on March the 19th, 1990, 24-year-old Andrew Wood died of a heroin overdose. His death strongly impacted both the band and the community. Special edition of The Rocket Report this week as I have some tragic news on the death of a major performer in the Seattle music scene. This Monday afternoon, Andrew Wood, lead singer for the popular band Mother Love Bone, was pronounced dead from complications resulting from a drug overdose. Mother Love Bone was one of the most popular and successful groups in the Northwest. They're considered one of the few bands that actually helped draw the national spotlight to Seattle. Wood was a highly charismatic singer that was in the top class of Seattle's performers, and he was one of the most visible members of any band on the Seattle club scene. When interviewed by The Rocket last year, Wood showed off his usual charm. I've been trained for this all my life, he said. I remember when I was 9 or 10, and I would wait until my parents would leave and go down to my room and put on Kiss Alive really loud. I live for that. 
Andrew Wood, one of the most alive front men in Seattle rock and roll, dead in his prime. Following Wood's death, as a tribute to his friend and former roommate, Soundgarden frontman Chris Cornell formed Temple of the Dog. Eddie Vedder also appeared as a guest to provide some lead and backing vocals. Vedder formed Pearl Jam with McCready, Gossard and Cameron. Yes, Cameron again, he's in everybody's band. Pearl Jam's debut album, 10, was released just four months after Temple of the Dog's only studio album. Pearl Jam went on to become one of the most internationally acclaimed and successful rock bands of the 1990s and beyond. It was in Ellensburg, Washington, in 1984, guitarist Gary Lee Connor, bassist Van Connor, formed Screaming Trees with vocalist Mark Lanigan and drummer Mark Pickerel, who was later replaced by Barrett Martin in 1991. They released several successful albums, including Sweet Oblivion and Dust, and they are considered one of the pioneering bands of the era, along with Green River, Melvins and Mudhoney. Lanigan was known for his deep, gravelly voice and basically being a massive giant. After Screaming Trees disbanded in the late 90s, Lanigan embarked on a successful solo career and he collaborated widely with artists including Queens of the Stone Age and his musical style evolved over the years incorporating elements of blues, folk and electronica but his powerful and haunting voice and poetic lyrics remained a constant hallmark of his work. Mark Lanigan's influence extended beyond his music and he's considered an iconic figure. His book was released in 2020, and it's fucking awesome. You should definitely go and read it, even if you're not into this shit. In 1989, following Nirvana's first US tour, Mark Lanigan and Mark Pickerel, along with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic, got together to form a side project called The Jury. They scheduled a recording session with producer Jack Endino with the possibility of a sub-pop release. However, upon arriving at the studio, they said, well, we tried writing some songs, but we didn't record them, and we forgot them all, so we're just going to do some Lead Belly covers instead. Cobain and Lanigan were both big fans of the American blues musician Lead Belly. The first song they recorded was Where Did You Sleep Last Night, with Lanigan on lead vocals. The second track was Grey Goose, which Lanigan was going to do vocals on, but it ended up being an instrumental. The final two tracks were Ain't It A Shame and They Hung Him On A Cross, both with Cobain on vocals. Despite the promising start, the project was unfortunately abandoned after the second session. Lanigan explained, We told Sub Pop that it probably wasn't going to happen, and that's when they suggested to me that I'd make a solo record. So in spite of the project falling apart, the sessions played an important role, as this was the point where Lanigan began to take a more active role in songwriting. Only one of the songs from the sessions made it onto an album. Where Did You Sleep Last Night was included on Lanigan's first solo album, The Winding Sheet. The three remaining tracks later appeared on Nirvana's B-Sides collection, With The Lights Out, in 2004. Cobain would later perform Where Did You Sleep Last Night to close out Nirvana's acclaimed 1994 MTV Unplugged in New York. Their Unplugged performance was in fact inspired by Lanigan's The Winding Sheet. Kurt looked up to Lanigan as an artist and a friend. And the jury remains likely a great band that never was. Screaming Trees bassist Van Connor died from pneumonia on January the 17th, 2023. Frontman Mark Lanigan sadly died aged 57 in February 2022.
The sophisticated DIY infrastructure of the Pacific Northwest music scene of the early 90s became the platform from which another subculture began. Grunge's pissed off and politically driven sister, Riot Girl. Associated with bands like Bikini Kill, Babes in Toyland, Sleater Kinney, and over in the UK, bands like Hoggy Bear and Skinned Teen. Combining feminism, politics, and punk rock, it served as a creative outlet for the anger and rage and frustration, for which at the time were less socially acceptable for women to openly express, particularly within the mainstream media. Voicing issues such as sexual violence, domestic abuse, racism, sexism, classism, ism-ism, is it ism? All of the isms. The movement quickly spread and soon became involved in grassroots organisation and activism. By the mid-1990s, it got completely bastardised and misrepresented by mainstream media who managed to completely subvert it resulting in the very regretful girl power like no we really didn't want your zigga zigga one of those bands was seven year bitch formed in 1990 co-founded by vocalist celine vigil and guitarist stephanie Sargent, along with bassist elizabeth davis and drummer valerie agnew stephanie and valerie had previously played together in wait for it barbie's dream car the band name Seven Year Bitch was obviously based on the movie Seven Year Itch with Marilyn Monroe. It was a suggestion by a friend from a band called Alcohol Funny Car. So Barbie's Dream Car and Alcohol Funny Car. I know which one I'm in, but I don't drive, and so it's fine. And it probably doesn't even have wheels. Anyway, so the band's first ever gig was opening for a local punk band called The Gits. They were named after a Monty Python sketch. Monty Python, in case you don't know, were a British comedy troupe. And I can remember when Seven Year Bitch got started, there was uh, Valerie Agnew and Celine and Stephanie Sargent and Liz Davis. And they were all huge fans of, of music and huge fans of the Gits. We so, you know, respected and re admired and looked up to them and, you know, just thought they were the shit. Both bands were signed to Seattle-based punk rock label CZ with Seven Year Bitch releasing three albums between 1990 and 1997. In 1992, the band were recording their first full album, Sikkim. On June the 28th, guitarist Stephanie Sargent attended a party where she consumed alcohol and used heroin. After returning home, she passed out on her back. She died from asphyxiation after choking on her vomit. At just 24 years old, she'd been sober for eight months. We got back home. Seven Year Bitch had just played a real big show, I think, opening for the Chili Peppers. The sort of fast success of Seven Year Bitch at that time, the momentum, became too much for Stephanie Sargent. And uh, she had, had, a, had been fighting a heroin addiction. It snuck up and bit her in the ass. Their album was released in October of that same year and was dedicated to Stephanie. After a grieving period, Irish musician Roshin Dunn would step in on guitars and would feature on the band's next two records. In 1993, another tragedy would devastate the community. This time, it wasn't drug-related, and I'm mentioning it because of the profound and lasting effect it had on the community. Members of Seven Year Bitch had been long-time friends of this Seattle punk band, The Gits, who in 1993 were gaining popularity both locally and internationally. They had plans for a US and European tour, and they were in the process of finishing and releasing their second album, Enter the Conquering Chicken. Gits frontwoman Mia Zapata, in spite of her small frame, possessed exceptionally strong and resonant vocals. The intensity within her was like something that was like both punk rock and blues and it, because it had that depth. I mean, you'd have to be a fucking zombie to not be affected. There was an awkwardness about her because she would pull her knees together and, you know, she looked like a chicken. I mean, she did. And it was awesome because you're like, who is this lady who sings like a heavy angel? It was like, where is Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith? Let's just like power punch them and power pack them, you know, inside this chicken woman 
who's got a lot of heart, you know, what's going on here? Besides her vocal ability, she was much loved for her sweet and magnetic personality and quirky sense of humor. Mia and I were just had a beautiful relationship. She was my best friend and um, just musically, it was just, just amazing. She was extremely affectionate and sincere, very, very intelligent and really funny. She was very private, very gentle. We'd be driving along hour upon hour and there'd be some cows out in uh, the pastures. And every time we saw cows, she would just go, those cows, they're outstanding in their field. At around 2 a.m. on July the 7th, 1993, while walking home from a venue, Mia Zapata was attacked, brutally beaten, violated and murdered. She was 27 years old. 27-year-old Mia Zapata was a singer on the brink of making it big. The band The Gits had recently released a full-length CD. National tour dates had just been finalized, but it's all over now. Zapata's body was found early Wednesday morning on a remote street in the Central District. Zapata had been strangled. Police are investigating, but so far they have no suspects or motives. Unfortunately, her killer seemingly vanished and the case went unsolved for a long time which sadly caused a lot of division within the community. You think things are bad and they get so much worse. Everybody was just blown away and just stunned and just grasping at anything and trying to figure it out. You didn't know if it was the guy that was sitting across the bar from you every night. When Mia was murdered, uh, you know, that just destroyed us all. It was never the same again. The main thing for me at that time was that she was gone and that she was dead and that she had suffered, that she had suffered. It wasn't until 2003 that Mia's killer was found, thanks to DNA profiling. Her life had been taken by a complete stranger who targeted her randomly. During the trial, the judge commented on how Zapata was an extraordinarily vibrant woman who was obviously talented and she was struck by how closely Zapata had connected to so many people. It never really sunk in that there was this tremendous following uh, of, of fans and uh, not to sound melodramatic, but even people who worshiped the ground she walked. I never thought of her as a star. It's just my daughter, you know, my daughter, Mia Zapata, 27 years old and double jointed. You know, that's who she was, who when we were on camping trips as a young kid would get mosquitoes in her hair. On the day of the wake, I happened to look outside and the line kept getting longer. And now it was like a half a block long. And all you could come up with is, well, these are fans and friends of Mia's. She was on loan to me. And, and uh, she now belongs to all of you. And it's, uh, it's neat. I like it. And I'm proud of her. Her killer, who I will not name, was sentenced to 37 years in prison, but died in 2021. Seven Year Bitch's second album, released in 1994, titled Viva Zapata, paid tribute. In 1997, following the departure of Seven Year Bitch guitarist, who left to pursue other opportunities, long-time friend and live sound engineer Lisa Faye Beatty stepped in. Throughout her career, Lisa Faye had sound engineered for various bands, including the Gits, and she'd also collaborated with numerous artists such as Iggy Pop and Sleepy Town Gorilla Museum. The band had planned to record a fourth album. They went their separate ways after seven years. Sadly, in 2011, Lisa Faye Beatty was involved in a fatal motorcycle accident. Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love, lead singer of the band Hole, were married on February the 24th, 1992, in Honolulu, Hawaii. Kurt wore his pyjamas to the ceremony. 
and on August 18th, 1992, Frances Bean Cobain was born. She's just turned 30. Fucking hell. One day in early April of 94, I was lying on my tattered cigarette burned sofa, chain smoking and watching stupid soap operas on TV with the sound off when my phone rang. As was my normal routine, I let the answering machine pick it up and waited to see if whoever called would leave a message. Hey man, it's Kurt. I'm back in town. What are you doing? Come on over and listen to records with me. I thought about it for a minute. Though I loved Kurt, I knew I wasn't calling back today. A. I had quite a bit of cash at the moment and plenty of dope, so the thought of possibly running out to score for him was a drag. And B. I assumed Courtney would be there. I'd become conditioned to steer clear of their house because every time I'd been there in recent months, some kind of drama would erupt between the two of them. He called twice more over the next couple hours. Despite the gnawing feeling that I was the world's shittiest friend, I never picked up. I was oblivious to the gathering storm headed in my direction. Late in the afternoon, I got a call from the entertainment lawyer I shared with Kurt, Rosemary Carroll. Mark, if you know where Kurt is, you need to tell me now. A couple minutes later, another message. If he's at your apartment and you're not telling me, we're going to have a problem. I called her back to assure her I wasn't hiding him. Mark, she said, I don't think you realize what's going on. He checked himself out of rehab yesterday, flew back to Seattle today, and now nobody can get in touch with him. He's probably fine, Rosemary. Don't worry. I'm sure he'll check in soon. In fact, I had not known what was going on. A highly publicized overdose earlier had been posed to both Dylan Carlson and me as accidental. I had also not known he'd left rehab and come home on the same day he called me. I called Kurt. No answer. I called our mutual friends, but no one had heard from him. I began to wonder if something was really wrong. I chastised myself for not answering the phone earlier, but I told myself, how could I know? How could I know what was really going on? How could I have known Courtney wasn't even there? How? 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 The next day, someone in the Nirvana camp asked if I would go with Dylan to some Capitol Hill dope houses to see if Kurt was hanging out in any of them. A private investigator Courtney had hired named Tom Grant picked us up. With money he supplied, we went from place to place, buying drugs and looking for Kurt to no avail. He couldn't be found. After we had gone to the spot of every last dealer we could think of, Grant drove us to Kurt's house near Lake Washington. We went from room to room calling his name, but there was no answer. I went outside to smoke a cigarette and stood at the bottom of a flight of stairs that led to a small room above his garage. For a moment, I thought about going up and taking a look. Just then, Dylan and Grant walked out, ready to leave. I knocked the cherry off my half-finished smoke and put the rest in my coat pocket. For a brief second, I had a terrible premonition, but I shook it off and got in the car eager to just get home and do my share of the heroin we had bought. A day or two later, Rosemary called me, her voice shaking with emotion, and delivered the news. Kurt's body had been found in the small room above his garage, the same room at which I had stood at the foot of earlier. A medical examiner judged his death to have taken place the same day we were at the house looking for him. I hung up the phone and burst into tears of remorse, self-hatred, and mountainous grief. I knew I would never get over his death. It would shadow me until the day I died. The tragic death of Kurt Cobain at the height of his fame completely shocked the world. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, maybe my parents didn't give a shit, but it was fucking huge. Kurt Donald Cobain was born in Aberdeen, Washington on February the 20th, 1967 to Wendy Elizabeth and Donald Leland Cobain. His younger sister, Kimberly, was born in 1970. His parents divorced when he was nine years old, which had a profound effect on him. He became defiant and withdrawn, but found solace in music and art, which he showed a natural talent for from a young age. His art revealed a fascination with physiology and human anatomy, and like his lyrics, often expressed unusual things themes and an interest in the macabre and a dark sense of humour. His daughter Frances Bean Cobain also went on to study art as a young adult. Nirvana is one of the biggest selling bands of all time, having sold more than 75 million records worldwide. 
They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014, and Kurt Cobain is remembered as one of the most influential rock musicians in the history of alternative music. Courtney's band Hole released their second studio album, titled Live Through This, on April the 12th, 1994, only four days after Kurt Cobain's body was found. In spite of the timing, those songs were written long before the passing of Kurt Cobain, and the origin of the title is said to have come from a conversation between Courtney and author and musician Kat Shelland during a difficult period in Courtney's life. However, due to the timing of the album release, it led to interpretations that linked the circumstances that surrounded Kurt's passing and the emotional aftermath. But the thing is, the record label decides when something's going to be released, and the title would have been picked long before. The circumstances surrounding Kurt Cobain's death have been the subject of many rumours and controversy over the years, some expressing concerns and claiming the police mishandled the investigation, and conspiracy theories suggesting foul play. With such a high-profile event, these things inevitably spread quickly and lead to varying degrees of accuracy and reliability in media reporting. The official conclusion remains that Kurt Cobain's death was a suicide and anything else should be viewed as speculative at best because there's just not enough evidence to prove these allegations. And while everyone's entitled to speculate and come up with their own theories unless there is an actual legal case happening, with respect to his daughter Frances Bean Cobain, I ask that you please refrain from debating about this in the comments. If you wish to do so, please do so on your own social media. I'm just not going to go there. But if you really want to get mysterious and speculative and conspiratorial, just look at every single death I talk about in this video. Lots of 27s and born in 1967s and oh, um, grunge. Anyway. Only two months later, on June the 16th, 1994, Kristen Pfaff, bass player of the band Hole, was found dead from a heroin overdose. Although it was widely reported, it was overshadowed somewhat by Cobain, who was by then a household name. Born on May the 26th, 1967, in Buffalo, New York, Kristen Marie Pfaff was classically trained, learning to play piano and cello at a young age, later teaching herself to play bass guitar. Kristen was an academic and a political activist with progressive views way ahead of her time. She worked as a counsellor for victims of sexual violence. Her understanding of political theory and feminism hugely motivated her approach to music, and she was openly critical of the Riot Girl movement. In 1991, Kristen, alongside guitarist and vocalist Joaquin Brewer, formerly of Minneapolis band The Bastards, and drummer Matt Ensminger, formed the band Janitor Joe. In 1993, Faf was scouted by Eric Erlansen and Courtney Love of Hole, who were at the time looking for a new bassist. She initially declined, but eventually accepted and moved to Seattle to begin working on the album Live Through This. Faf's time in Seattle was a creatively rich period. She formed a close friendship with Kurt Cobain, but while living in Washington's heroin capital, Faf began using. She entered a Minneapolis detox center for heroin addiction in February of 1994, and in the spring of 94, she toured with Janitor Joe. Following the death of Kurt Cobain on April the 5th, Faf decided to leave Hole and return to Minneapolis permanently. She returned to her Seattle apartment to retrieve her belongings on June the 14th and had planned to leave on June the 16th with her friend Paul Erickson, a member of the group Hammerhead. Eric Erlansen visited the night before and she took a bath around 9 p.m. Paul Erickson checked on her thinking he heard snoring. It was common for her to fall asleep in the bathtub, her father Norman Pfaff said. Erickson thought nothing of it and went to bed. At approximately 9.30 a.m. the following morning, Erickson forced open the bathroom door and found Kristen deceased from an accidental heroin overdose. Numerous conspiracy theories surround her death. This has often been the case with public figures throughout history, particularly those associated with controversial personalities, such as Courtney Love. The sad fact is, relapse and death from heroin is extremely common. After detox, when people relapse, they tend to go back to using the same amount that they've always used. And this is what is deadly. Her mother released a book titled Unfinished Rhapsody, The Other Side of Fame. What bothers me is the way this has been sensationalized around Kristen. All this happened in the last year of her life. She did have problems in the last year, but what about her other 26 years? 
The media missed the fact of what an accomplished musician she was, what a good person she was and all the good things she did. And this year, a guy did a TED talk. He is just about to release a book on the life of Kristen Pfaff. I've linked the TED talk below and I did contact him and it is going to be released soon. But if it is of interest, go follow him and grab it when it comes out. In 1987, guitarist and vocalist Jerry Cantrell and drummer Sean Kinney formed the band Alice in Chains, later recruiting bassist Mike Starr. And Lane Staley, of course. Staley was sort of living at the Music Bank, which was a recording studio, and because Cantrell had been kicked out of his family home, because they were both homeless, they basically became housemates. Lane Staley had struggled with drug addiction throughout the 90s. Screaming Trees' Mark Lanigan recalled partying with Staley on tour. Offstage, it was an insane, dark, drug and alcohol-fueled frat party from start to finish, with Lane and I raising hell, behaving like teenagers, staying up for days on end. We partook of whatever drugs came our way. Heroin, cocaine, painkillers, anything. One night, while riding on Alice's bus with Lane, we got so shit-faced we tore apart the back lounge of the bus in a drunken frenzy, leaving a huge mess. The next day, I was ashamed to receive a kind yet stern talking to from my now ex-manager who told me that Lane and I were to clean up the mess immediately and that I was no longer allowed to ride on their bus. So remember earlier, this band and these guys, well, these guys had gone on to form Pearl Jam with Eddie Vedder. So also in 1994, while Pearl Jam were producing their third studio album, Vitology, guitarist Mike McCready, he went into drug rehab in Minnesota, where he met bass player John Baker Saunders. On their return to Seattle, they formed a side band along with vocalist Lane Staley of Alice in Chains and Screaming Trees drummer Barrett Martin. Mike McCready had hoped that being around sober musicians would push Staley to get himself sober. Mad Season's 1995 album, Above, was awarded a gold record for sales in the USA. It was the only album that Mad Season would record. On October the 29th, 1996, after a long and brutal struggle with addiction and its resulting health issues, Demry Lara Parrow, model, actress and former fiancé of Lane Staley, died of a drug overdose at the age of 27. After meeting, Demry and Lane had quickly fallen in love. They had eventually separated, but Demry was known to be the love of his life, and after her passing, Lane was placed on a 24-hour suicide watch. He soon spiralled into a deep depression, which only fueled his addiction. Bass player John Baker Saunders, who had originally met Mike McCready back in rehab, also had a relapse with heroin and died of an overdose on January the 15th, 1999. Between 1999 and 2002, Staley had become reclusive, rarely leaving his Seattle condo. He grew increasingly disconnected from his friends and bandmates and family. They'd repeatedly tried to get him into rehab, and when they did see him, it was very noticeable that his health had declined. He'd lost teeth and he weighed very little. On April the 4th, 2002, Alice in Chains' original bass player, Mike Starr, had been to visit Staley, who was very sick but refused to get medical help. I was with Lane the day, uh, it was my birthday, and I was with him all that day on my birthday, trying to keep him alive. And uh, I... I even asked him if I could call 911, you know, and he said if, uh, if I did, he would never talk to me again. The two briefly argued, and Starr eventually stormed out. He said that Staley had called after him as he left. Not like this. Don't leave like this. On April the 19th, 2002, former Allison Chains manager Susan Silver contacted Staley's mother, Nancy McCallum, because the singer's bank account hadn't been active for around two weeks. So... They called the police and then went to Staley's home to do a wellness check. His partially decomposed body had to be identified through dental records. The autopsy revealed that he died from a mixture of heroin, cocaine and just really, really ill health two weeks before his body was found on April the 5th, the same day that Kurt Cobain had died eight years prior. Staley's death was classified as accidental 
Although I have read on the Lane Staley Fund website that his death was attributed to early onset old age from excessive use of prescription and illegal drugs, primarily heroin. He was 34. The thing is, during those two weeks as he lay dead, fans all over the world would have been listening to his music and nobody knew that he'd passed away. This wasn't the fault or anything to do with lack of care by his friends and family. They really did try, but basically he'd cut everyone off. It's just very sad. The Channel Rock Realm made an in-depth documentary about Lane, which details his drug and health issues. It's deeply harrowing, but I do recommend it if you're interested in learning more about what happened to Lane. He's made a few other related documentaries. I can't vouch for the accuracy of them, but they are definitely worth a watch. What I recommend more, though, is to go and watch Alice in Chains Unplugged, even if you're not into their music otherwise, because let's face it, during the Lane era, their music got kind of fucking dark. But that's exactly what drew me to them. But even if it's not for you, the Unplugged album is a great example of just how talented a vocalist he was. He is truly missed. Mike Starr was the last known person to have seen Staley alive, which continued to haunt him from there on. On March the 8th, 2011, police were called to a home in Salt Lake City where they found Mike Starr's body. He died of a prescription drug overdose at the age of 44. Alice in Chains was like some massive apocalyptic machine on stage. No matter what shape Lane was in, no matter how little sleep we'd had, he would fucking kill it every night. Lane was such a monster vocalist. I was amazed that after partying with me the previous 24 hours, Staley could get up and roar in a voice so painfully powerful you could feel it physically while watching them side stage. He was the most singularly impressive hard rock singer I would ever hear. Up there was some of the greats from my youth. As I mentioned earlier, a number of non-Seattle bands had been lumped in with the scene, including Stone Temple Pilots. Their lead vocalist, Scott Wheeland, was known for his flamboyant and chaotic persona. He would later sing for rock supergroup Velvet Revolver alongside members of Guns N' Roses, but ultimately he was dismissed by both bands because of his really erratic behaviour, and his career was plagued by substance abuse issues. It's just so sad to look back um, at what the four of us, to be affiliated with somebody of that musical magnitude and to be so fulfilled by it and to watch this person just kind of go into this deep hole of demise was just awful. It was just awful, man. Scott just kept getting deeper and deeper and farther and farther. And um, I think Robert and Eric and I were the three people in his life that didn't co-sign his jive any longer. And we were the last people he wanted to be around. So it just, the separation just got farther and farther and the communication broke down more and more. We spent half our lives trying, you know, and there's, you know, well, I think addiction doesn't lead you to honesty and the truth from other people. You kind of run from that and that's what, you know, kind of happened. In December of 2015, Wheeland was on tour with his band, The Wildabouts. On December the 3rd, in Bloomington, Minnesota, Scott Wheeland was found dead on his tour bus, the result of an accidental overdose, along with other health issues, at 48 years old. So remember way back about three hours ago we talked about how Chris Cornell of Soundgarden was flatmates with Andrew Wood. So his band, Soundgarden, they got kind of big. It's highly unlikely that you haven't seen their video to Black Hole Sun. That was their biggest hit. And if you haven't seen it, you've either been living in a weird cult or living under an actual rock like Patrick Starr. Good morning!
Born in Seattle, Washington in July 1964, Chris Cornell was one of six siblings. For two years between ages 9 to 11, he immersed himself in the Beatles after finding a collection of abandoned records in a neighbor's basement. During his teenage years, Cornell struggled with severe depression, anxiety, and agoraphobia, causing him to drop out of school and retreat into a world of social isolation. By the age of 13, he was using drugs and alcohol on a daily basis, but he found refuge in music. Cornell had dabbled in piano and guitar as a child, but it was a snare drum, a gift from his mother, that ignited his passion for rock and roll. His musical journey began with Seattle-based cover band, The Shemps, along with bassist Hiro Yamamoto and later with the addition of guitarist Kim Thale. In 1984, the three musicians would form Soundgarden, with Cornell initially on drums. In 1985, Scott Sunquist took over as drummer, allowing Cornell to focus on his vocals. Matt Cameron, drummer for Skinyard, eventually took over on drums. In 1990, as a tribute to his late friend Andrew Wood, he formed the band Temple of the Dog. From 2001 to 2007, he fronted the supergroup Audio Slave, featuring members of Rage Against the Machine, and collaborated with numerous other musicians. In 1990, Chris Cornell married Suzanne Silver, manager of Alice in Chains, and they welcomed a daughter, Lillian Jean, in 2000. The couple later parted ways. In 2004, Cornell married his second wife, Vicky, and the couple had two children, daughter, Tony, and son, Christopher Nicholas. And in 2012, the couple established the Chris and Vicky Cornell Foundation, aimed at supporting vulnerable children. Throughout his life, Chris Cornell spoke openly about his battles with depression and addiction, advocating for mental health awareness. The next tragedy was a huge shock. At around 12.15 a.m. on May the 18th, 2017, just hours after performing at a show with his band, Chris Cornell was found by his bodyguard unconscious in the bathroom of his hotel. He was laying on the floor with an exercise band around his neck. Unfortunately, medics were unable to revive him and he was pronounced dead at 1.30 a.m. at the age of 52. The cause of his death was officially ruled a suicide by hanging. It was really a shock. It was a huge shock and a huge loss. Cornell achieved a long period of sobriety, but unfortunately relapsed in 2016 after a shoulder injury. The pain was waking him up at night and he was prescribed benzodiazepine to help him sleep. Even for those with no history of addiction, Benzos are extremely addictive and habit-forming. Many who begin taking them for sleep or stress later find themselves in painful withdrawals. Chris soon began misusing the pills. The coroner determined Cornell's death was a suicide by hanging, indicating that his drug use did not directly cause his death. However, in an interview with Cornell's widow, Vicky, she stated that something seemed seriously wrong with him when they spoke that night. He was slurring his words like he used to when he took OxyContin. Even if drugs weren't the direct cause, he'd lived with mental illness for most of his life. With a relapse after such a long period of sobriety, it's difficult to imagine that not having an effect on his brain chemistry and mental health, even if it wasn't immediately obvious to him or those around him. We can speculate, but the only person who really knows what happened that night is no longer with us. In 1994, Cornell was interviewed by Rolling Stone and when asked about Kurt Cobain's suicide, whether it's legitimate to read a songwriter's suicide into his lyrics after the fact, Cornell said, when Andy Wood died, I couldn't listen to his songs for about two years after that. And it was for that reason. His lyrics often seem as though they can tell that story. But then again, my lyrics often tell the same one. In terms of seeing everything as a matter of life and death, if it's that what you're feeling at the time, then that's what you're going to write. It's a sort of morbid exchange when somebody who is a writer like that dies, and then everyone starts picking through their lyrics. In Kurt's case, whatever he was thinking and whatever he was writing, there was no arrow pointing at what his demise was. It's a possibility. It's definitely something that someone was feeling when they were writing. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't either. We're nearly there, I promise. After the departure of Scott Wheeland, Stone Temple Pilots had recruited Lincoln Park frontman to take the helm as lead singer. Chester Bennington had been very close to Chris Cornell. Considering him like a brother, both their families were very close. On July the 20th, 2017, on what would have been Cornell's 53rd birthday and only two months after his death, Chester Bennington would be found dead in his home. The coroner ruled his death a suicide by hanging. Dave Grohl of Nirvana. Don't worry, Dave Grohl is currently safe. But he went on to form the Foo Fighters. You might have heard of them. They've done a few gigs here and there. I saw them at the Reading Festival. It was their first ever UK festival gig. And some moron had put them in a fairly small tent, which meant the minute everyone jumped up, we all got kind of stuck in the air. And I was in the middle of the front. And so basically I was clinging on to my little bag, just looking up, um, trying to breathe. And um, the band did stop and um, kind of dragged those of us that were getting squashed and crushed out of the audience. Oh, really? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hey, everybody in the middle, kind of move away because I think there's something that's hurt in there. We got to hold, we got to stop for a second and make sure everybody's okay down in the front. We're going to wait for a second while they pull all these people out of the crowd just so they don't get hurt. Anyway, so I drank all this water. I got diarrhea. I wiped my ass with a sock. I threw it out the window and it landed on a skinhead's head. Hey, dude. Hey. Hey, mister on the pole. You coming down? I think they think you're a wanker. (laughs) And then I was completely drenched in water so I, I, my clothes were drenched through and, but somebody had lit a fire outside so I went and sat around the fire but we were made to put it out because apparently people were still not able to breathe in the crowd so the next thing I know I woke up in a white tent with nothing except for my underwear and I was wrapped in a foil blanket and uh, it turned out I developed hypothermia but I did get um, some jam sandwiches and a pair of jeans and t-shirt out of it so it was all good and it was a fucking wicked festival Anyway, I digress. On March the 25th, 2022, while on tour in Bogota, Colombia, the Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins was found unresponsive in his hotel room after complaining of chest pains. CPR was performed, but he was declared dead at the scene. Taylor was 50. While his cause of death is unclear, the toxicology report revealed that he had 10 substances in his system, including opioids, benzos, antidepressants and THC. To put into context, just by the end of the 90s, if you were a fan of this music, your music collection had already begun to rack up a noticeable body count. It seemed like every band that you liked had tragically lost a member to heroin or suicide or was struggling with drug addiction and now in 2023 even without mentioning all of the ones that I just mentioned just of the big four mainstream grunge bands only one original frontman is still alive and if you throw in Stone Temple Pilots that's two more frontmen fucking hell like while other scenes and eras have faced comparable tragedies like if you look at the 60s obviously A lot of similar things happen then, but what distinguishes this era is the depth of the interconnectedness among its members, which heightened the profound impact of these losses. Of everyone I've spoken about today, several of them didn't make it to 30, and none of them made it to 60. For some, it seemed like the moment they even became vaguely linked to the grunge scene, they were doomed. Of course, that's ridiculous. It's simply a very tragic set of circumstances involving heroin and mental illness but if it wasn't obvious I fucking love grunge that was my era I'm an old bastard not that old yet though so fuck off throughout the 90s and early 2000s there were numerous deaths in the music industry involving artists from elsewhere what all of these artists have in common was their struggle with substance abuse and mental health issues 
Many of these deaths were devastating to me personally, and while I am nostalgic as fuck about the 90s, it kind of really was a shit time for musicians dropping dead. I've dabbled with plenty of fun chemicals, but it was usually hallucinogens and operas. I don't think I ever really wanted to be numb. Well, I did. I mean, believe me, I sometimes still do. But I learned a long time ago that pain is necessary. Grief is necessary. It can be unbearable, but you don't get life without loss and death. There isn't happy without sad. Pain and sadness are obvious themes in all of the music of these artists, and it was their music that kept many of us going through our darkest times. There's no glorification in any of this, and I'm not trying to cash in on death in any way. If I was going to do that, I'd have probably sold bootleg Nirvana t-shirts back in the 90s. And by using The Sims, I'm not intending to be disrespectful either. That's why I didn't recreate the fucking scene of Kurt Cobain's death or something like that. It's just gross. I always hated that photo. It was printed all over the newspapers, like the day after it happened. It was fucking awful. You could tell it was him. These people, these artists, their music and their lyrics have played a huge part in my life since my teens. And I just wanted to talk about why the fuck they aren't here anymore, because they should be. There's nothing to mock about those that lost their own battles. They weren't weak or cowardly. Many of us lose our way. Some of us just don't make it back. My channel's not monetized, so I don't get anything out of this in that way. But if you, if you do want to do anything, go and listen to their fucking music. And if you really want to give something, please support this. Shortly after Lane Staley's death, his parents, Nancy McCallum and Phil Staley, started to receive donations from fans from all over the world. So they decided to work with THS, or Therapeutic Health Services, and they created the Lane Staley Memorial Fund in 2002. Nancy says that she sees it as a way of partnering with Lane on the next step in his work. He was very honest with people about the effects of drug use, and he urged them not to follow in his footsteps. Therapeutic Health Services serves thousands of men, women and children and young adults struggling with behavioural health issues in Washington State. They provide person-centred care and health services to at-risk youth and adults struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues as well as chemical dependency and rehabilitation services and they are proud to manage the Lane Staley Memorial Fund treating heroin addicts and their families in the Seattle music community. Love it or hate it, this was a pivotal moment in music and it struck a chord with a generation that yearned for authenticity, seeking to confront and articulate the harsher, darker truths of life. Bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden and Alice in Chains gave voice to the disillusioned and disenchanted. It fostered a sense of belonging while celebrating individuality and challenging conventional standards but it ultimately left an indelible print in its wake. To paraphrase a quote by Hunter S. Thompson, No mix of words or music or memories can touch that sense of knowing that you were there and alive in that corner of time and the world, whatever it meant. History is hard to know because of all the hired bullshit, but without even being sure of history, it seems entirely reasonable to think that every now and then, the energy of a whole generation comes to a head in a long, fine flash for reasons that nobody really understands at the time and which never explain, in retrospect, what actually happened. There was a fantastic universal sense that whatever we were doing was right, that we were winning. And that, I think, was the handle. That sense of inevitable victory over the forces of old and evil. Not in any mean or military sense. We didn't need that. Our energy would simply prevail. We had all the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. And with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark. That place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. If you managed to get to the end of this video without throwing yourself off a cliff, well done, you're fucking amazing. Thank you. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already and please comment because like it, it tickles the algorithm and it likes to be tickled. And I shall see you in another hopefully slightly less dark video.